Welcome to Identifying Horticultural Pests and Problems. My name is Elizabeth Wally and I'm an Extension Horticulture Educator for University of Illinois Extension. This presentation is designed to offer visual aids for identifying common and sometimes not so common pests of garden plants. An example of a common garden pest is the tomato hornworm. Maybe not so common are the white cigar shaped structures you see in the left picture. These are actually the pupae of a beneficial parasitic wasp. Sometimes we see signs of an insect pest before we see the insect itself. This peach was brought in for diagnosis and was later confirmed to be the result of terrapin scale feeding. Terrapin scale are sap feeding insects that are usually located in the upper branches of fruit trees. As terrapin scale feed, they excrete a liquid sugary substance called honeydew that rains down on all surfaces below. This sugary substance is perfect for secondary fungal growth which results in the blackened color of the fruit. Terrapin scale are not as common on fruit trees as San Jose scale. San Jose scale are also a pest on both stone fruit and palm fruit. They are easily detected against the unripe or yellow skin of an apple, whereas more difficult to detect against the red skin of an apple. San Jose scale on the wood in large enough numbers will give the tree a whitish to a ghostly appearance. Remember, a sticky residue is evidence of a sap feeding insect. Potted plants such as a Meyer lemon are also susceptible to citrus scale. Spider mites are sap feeding insect relatives. Symptoms of injury include flecking, discoloration, and scorching of leaves. Spider mites are small in size and difficult to identify with the human eye. Using a hand lens, look on the underside of leaves first and also for signs of webbing. Aphids are another group of sap feeding insects. They have a wide host range not only on edible plants but also on ornamental plants. If you'll note in the center picture, the rosy apple aphids actually cause leaf distortion and by unrolling the leaves, you're e more easily able to identify their presence. Note the woolly apple aphids in the upper left hand side actually excrete a cottony or a woolly type mass to give them their name which actually protects them from any insecticide application so their control is somewhat more difficult. From year to year we have a number of galls. Some are more common than others. Um, I have pictured here four that uh, appear to look like galls. One actually is not. Can you identify which one is not actually a gall? I'll give you a few seconds to kind of look over the four uh, pictures and decide which one you think is not a gall. Now I've put up the labels here so you can see that in the lower right hand corner the magnolia uh, picture is actually its fruiting structure. But someone who has not seen a magnolia fruit before might become concerned thinking that they have some form of gall in their magnolia. Let me reassure you that uh, this actually is its fruiting structure and is not a gall. The other three pictures though are in fact galls and have been um, are the cause of an insect uh, that has attacked the plant. Some of these we see uh, irregularly, meaning we don't see them year in and year out, and others we see on a more regular. And so I have uh, some of the more uncommon ones are the grape filbert gall and the walnut leaf petiole gall. And we're seeing the gouty oak gall more commonly, particularly in, in um, some of our uh, native trees. Continuing on with galls, I want to show some pictures of uh, or point out that galls are uh, caused by not only insects, which I have pictured here. I have the gouty oak gall that's caused by a wasp. Again, the grape filbert gall formed by a midge. Um, the gouty vein gall on maple is caused by a midge as well. And we have the uh, walnut leaf petiole gall and the ear fed mite gall on raspberry are both mites. But we also have galls that are uh, caused by bacteriums as shown here on crown gall on grape and crown gall on dahlia. We also have 
galls that are uh, from uh, infection of a fungal pathogen. And here I have shown the cedar rust gall that we see usually every spring uh, on our cedar trees. Slime molds are a common occurrence. We usually see this uh, more commonly when new mulch has been laid down. Um, but this is a primitive organ organism that uh, flows like an amoeba over a lot of vegetation. Uh, we commonly see it uh, across new mulch, but you can also see it uh, kind of sliming its way across plant material, sidewalks, driveways, various other places. Very easy to control by just getting out a leaf rake and, and breaking it up and, and kind of tearing it down. Um, they can come in, as you see pictured here, in a number of different colors, um, but they all somewhat have that uh, appearance of just a pool of slime. Um, they really, they look slimy, but they actually have somewhat of a dry powdery nature to them. Every year we have unexpected leaf feeders or, or different pests that we don't see from year to year. In 2012, we had a lot of reports of the Genista broom moth on Baptisia. Um, we usually think of this as an insect pest of both Baptisia and crepe myrtle, um, but we do not see it every year. Uh, 2012 was a year for uh, Southern Illinois uh, gardeners to have this insect pest in their Baptisia. Um, you can see in the upper left hand a, a, a plant that has not been affected and in the lower center picture you can see a Baptisia fronting a crepe myrtle that has been totally defoliated. Interestingly, um, this is an insect that we think of as preferring crepe myrtle, but in the lower picture it was actually the um, Baptisia that was uh, totally defoliated. Rust diseases are common year to year and on specific plants. Um, orange rust on blackberry, again, very specific to varieties. Some blackberries have better resistance than other. Um, Navajo is an example of a blackberry that is very susceptible uh, to orange rust. Um, let me just say that if you uh, develop this in your blackberry plants, the plant should be removed immediately because this is a systemic uh, rust fungus unlike many of the others and uh, the plant cannot be cured once it has been become infected. So if you have this in your planting there needs to be preventative sprays on all the unaffected plants. Now there are other rusts that we commonly see if you've ever grown hollyhocks. Um, you will notice I have pictured here a hollyhock that has uh, rust on it, very common. And we have a number of um, cedar related, meaning that the cedar tree is one of the um, host, um, requires two. So in the center picture, cedar hawthorn rust, um, and I have a picture of it on hawthorn. Cedar quince rust, now this is an apple. Apples can actually get cedar quince rust, and this is an apple pictured here. And it's usually on the um, bottom side of the fruit that you see this type of distortion from uh, the quince rust. Now this um, fruit tree would have shown symptoms on the leaf, um, somewhat similar to what the cedar apple rust pictures are in the lower center picture. Powdery mildew is very common and in 2012 it was more so. Um, we had very good conditions for the development of powdery mildew so we saw it um, beyond what we normally see it on. It's very common to see it on zinnias, um, on monardas, and uh, we also saw it on peaches in the upper left hand. You can see a small fruit that has a white spot on it. That is powdery mildew. Um, it is a common pest of grapes, and you can see it in the venation um, on the um, grape picture. Tomatoes, uh, if you look with a hand lens, you'll see the white powdery substance um, there, but you'll also start seeing this white um, turning into uh, yellow uh, chloroticness. Pumpkins, but you usually don't notice it until it's on the upper leaf blade surface, but in this case, um, it usually starts on the stems and petioles first, so you need to be inspecting your pumpkins before it gets actually to the leaf because it's well advanced by that stage. Apples with powdery mildew, it's usually uh, the powdery substance is very uh, evident uh, either to the naked eye or with the hand lens, but also with it is the new growing point or the leaves around the new growing 
uh, growth um, is strapped, uh, somewhat tattered looking and scorched. So uh, in the lower right hand you can see uh, what powdery mildew looks like on apples. Um, very large host range. Lots of plants when conditions are good for powdery mildew will develop this. Uh, for example, the cornice or the dogwoods will get um, powdery mildew as well, which I don't have a picture of, but looks somewhat similar to what you're seeing here. Viral diseases are somewhat like the orange rust that I mentioned on um, the raspberries on the previous slide. Um, once a plant is infected with a viral disease, we do not have a cure for it. Uh, so here pictured just so that you uh, recognize it when it's in your garden. Um, these are plants that should be rogued out once they've been identified with infection. Um, grape plants, it's very common to have some level of virus and many of the plants can live for a number of years um, with virus, but to be able to identify it you can see here, if you look closely at the leaves, you can see that the, the, the pigment or the green coloration in the leaf is not uniform and the leaf is not fully expanded. It's somewhat puckered along the venation. The next picture down is blackberry sterility virus. Um, when you have blackberries and, and suddenly um, you don't have good set um, or they don't set at all or have no fruit when they've been doing well, that usually is a result of some um, form of virus. I have pictured uh, the green apple green crinkle virus um, that causes extreme distortion of the fruit. Now this one's not as common just using as an example. It's not always um, that leaves are affected. Um, as with blackberries the fruit can be affected as well. With pumpkins uh, in this picture you can see that the leaves are greatly distorted. Uh, almost look like that they have 2,4-D injury on them, but the, the fruit itself will be mottled and distorted as well. And horseradish virus infected again um, somewhat has a chlorotic or a mosaic pattern on the leaves as well. All of these um, are examples of what viral diseases can look like in plants. Sometimes, which I don't have here, is that you'll see a plant um, that looks very bushy, uh, stunted, meaning that the uh, inner nodes are very compacted and it almost looks like uh, a broom um, on the plant. And again, that's usually a general sign that there's some sort of viral infection. It can be caused by other things, but again, that's something that should be considered when you see um, unusual growth patterns like that. An insect pass that we see more commonly on certain plants is pictured here. Uh, quite common to see uh, leaf miners on hollyhock and you can see the uh, rust uh, in combination with the leaf miner. So plants do not always have just one pass. Sometimes there can be multiple problems all at once. Uh, in the lower problem, if you've ever, picture if you've ever um, grown columbine, uh, almost always it has somewhat of a variegated nature to it, which it's not actually a variegation. This is a result of leaf miner on there. So uh, you can kind of see where they've just kind of crawled all over um, between the upper and lower leaf surfaces and the insect is actually uh, feeding inside there, damaging the leaf. Every year I get calls on um, People, particularly if they have pecan trees, they report that there are just hundreds of twigs laying on the grass. You know, it's like all the tips of the, the branches have dropped off. Well, my first thought is that they have a twig girdler or a twig pruner. And I have pictured here, I was walking in a pecan nursery and looked up and happened to see one of these twig tips that had not fallen yet as a result of one of the uh, twig girdlers. And so you can see that the, uh, what happens here is the female that's pictured in the lower center lays her eggs on the tips of the branches and then climbs in a little bit and very nicely um, girdles the branches or prunes it. And with the slightest wind, it will drop off to the ground. And remember, the eggs are on the twig and they drop to the ground. So they complete their life cycle then um, from that stage. So if you are um, picking up a, an awful lot of small uh, twig ends, look at the end and see if it looks like it has been precision cut. 
some of these will make some of these uh, girdlers and pruners will make straight cuts some of them make beveled cuts but in general they're very precision cut and help you identify whether you have this particular pest um, that will you know if it has a ragged end that's usually just result of um, natural uh, wind breakage Sap suckers and other woodpeckers can be a problem with trees. Um, an example of a sap sucker, they not only will they feed on any um, insects that are feeding underneath the bark, but they also feed on the cambial layer um, of the tree itself. So a small amount of feeding, the, usually the tree can heal itself from that, and that's an example in the lower uh, left-hand picture. There you can see uh, two or three holes, and if you could get a better angle, which I did, I took the picture, you can see that the tree is actually healed from this already. So that's a minor uh, feeding from sap sucker. But if you look in the upper left hand, now this is pretty significant feeding and actually can reduce the vigor of a tree if the sap suckers continue to feed at this level on a tree. So this one must, for whatever reason, taste particularly good. Now really there's not a whole lot of control when you're talking about birds other than to wrap something like hardware cloth or bird lap around the, feet, the area that they seem to want to feed in to actually physically uh, prevent them from getting to the tree. Now certain, um, when you grow certain crops or other certain ornamental plants, it's probably best to identify what are the really common pest of these. Now when we're talking about asparagus you can almost assume that you're going to have uh, asparagus a beetle come in at some point. Now in the lower uh, right hand picture you can see the orange or somewhat orange red adult with black uh, striping on it and what those little black um, threads on the asparagus are actually the eggs. Now if you look at the um, video that I took of an actual larva you can see that the larva is not only feeding there but it's also somewhat um, crawling around the eggs so you can get somewhat of a scale of the larva to the eggs to the adults here. Now if you don't have a whole lot um, this the adults and the larva can easily be picked off and the eggs usually in general um, rub off or rinse off fairly easily so if you're organic um, you can just do it, uh, manage it by hand, but there are, uh, just so you know, some insecticide options as well. In 2012, uh, peonies uh, really had a problem with botrytis. Now this is a problem that we see to some extent, usually year to year, but in 2012 we saw it more heavily than others, and you can see that uh, this is uh, on the leaves. The plants seem to be doing well, but the leaves are just um, the appearance of them is not as nice as we'd like to see because of the uh, fungal pathogen and you can see that it turns out to be blackened spots um, throughout the leaf canopy on this. Again, um, this is something that um, uh, unless you have heavy infestations, usually uh, removal um, as soon as the plants start to decline uh, instead of letting it stay out for the whole entire season is a good option. There are fungicide options available. Uh, they usually need to be done early in the season if you're going to use them. Iris also in 2012 showed an ele elevated uh, level of the fungal leaf spots that are on the uh, leaf blades themselves. Um, for the most part there are fungicide applications that can be done if there's a heavy infestation that usually needs to start when the plants are fairly early in the season. Um, just a reminder that any time that you are removing uh, affected leaf material, this is not material that you should be putting in your compost pile. This is something that should be uh, either burned or buried. Um, and if you don't have either of those options, then those uh, uh, need to be removed from site so that they are not a source for reinfection the next year. I'm using grapes here as an example of a crop that has numerous pests associated with it. Um, here you will see that uh, I'm showing three of the more common diseases and those would be the anthracnose, the phomopsis, and the black rot. With the black rot you'll be able to identify it with the orange spots on the leaves and the fruit will actually start to um, rot and blacken and turn into mummies on the vine. With anthracnose you see pitting 
on the new wood and the fruit will develop kind of a bird eye. That means a, a grayish lesion with a dark uh, margin around the edge to give it kind of that eyeball look to it. And then phomopsis is somewhat of a scarring on the wood and puckering and zippering of the leaves. And it will also, if uh, left unattended, will cause some uh, rotting of the fruit cluster as well. The leaf face phylloxera is a galling. Uh, it is an insect pest that uh, feeds not only in the upper part but also on the roots of the plant too, but the leaf phase is actually a gall on the leaves as shown here. Moving on with certain plants that we just know are going to have problems. I started off with grapes and this is a less serious um, in terms of um, the fitness of the plant, but in terms of visual appearance can be fairly devastating, somewhat like getting anthracnose on sycamore. Um, without control, um, certain plants can just, in our climate, can look ugly year to year to year. And here's an example of a red buckeye, uh, Gennardia blanche of Aesculus. Um, most of the Aesculus or um, the buckeye family will get this to some level without control. Now one that I know doesn't usually show signs of this would be the bottle brush. So those are usually um, fairly um, resistant or tolerant of it. Now if you want to grow something like a red buckeye you need to be prepared um, to do some fungicide applications early in the season to uh, keep their appearance uh, looking nice throughout the season. There are certain plants that are just challenging to grow, um, and this is the example that I want to give you, and this is canker and dieback of cornus, and in this case, particularly the red and yellow twig. Um, this is a picture of red twig, and you can see the canker uh, that is on uh, one of the stems, and this stem will eventually um, die off. So this is a plant that needs constant maintenance, um, there aren't good fungicide recommendations for this, so uh, to keep this plant healthy, you need to be constantly looking at it and pruning out any uh, cankers in the plant. So if you're growing something like red twig or yellow twig, um, be looking at it a little more closely than you do some of your other plants. Just showing you again some um, things to look for. Uh, unusual uh, on your plant. This is a picture of anthracnose on blackberries. I showed you anthracnose on grape as well. This is what it looks like on blackberry um, and raspberry. It has a very distinct lesion uh, and it usually has a purplish red uh, ring around it. This is very um, diagnostic of anthracnose on uh, raspberries. Now this is one again uh, removal of canes that are infected, and then fungicide applications for protecting canes that are not already infected uh, would be in order. I'm going to kind of step away from some of the actual plant insect and disease problems and talk to you about some other issues in gardening that uh, we get a lot of questions on, and one of them is report of feral honeybees. And sometimes we see um, a honeybee hive that is not enclosed uh, in a space. Uh, this is a free hanging hive and uh, sometimes they are actually in swarm where there's no hive. They just kind of gather up together in a big, big uh, collection of bees. And so a uh, recommendation that um, if they're in a place that you don't want them to be, one of the things that you can do before calling an exterminator uh, if the bees are easily accessed, to contact your local extension office for a list of local beekeepers. Uh, many times beekeepers will come out and collect them for free for you and remove uh, the hazard and add them to their uh, colonies that they are uh, using for honey production. Bagworms begin to build their case from surrounding materials as soon as they hatch. Bagworms prefer juniper, arborvitae, spruce, pine, and cedar. Trunk damage is often difficult to assess. If safety is a concern, call an arborist. Do not apply any wound care products as they often interfere with the tree's natural ability to heal. Protect from any further damage. For example, for insects, apply trunk sprays, systemic drenches, or injections. For rodent control, clear away weeds and any volcano mulches that might provide protection from predators. 
The first step in safe and proper pesticide use is to thoroughly read the label. Remember, if it's not labeled for use, it's not legal to apply. Should you make a mistake and apply a pesticide that is not labeled for use on an edible crop, it is no longer deemed safe to consume. There is no wash-off option and there is no wait time period for that season. For safety's sake, we don't consider it safe to eat. Manure is still a valuable nutritional input, but a few guidelines should be followed for its safe use. When using fresh manure, wait at least 120 days before harvesting a high-risk crop. A high-risk crop is usually a low-growing crop that has a high probability of intercepting a foodborne pathogen from a water splash. For all other crops, wait at least 90 days before harvesting. If you apply manure within 60 days of harvest, use only aged, at least for a year, or hot composted manure. Never apply after the garden is planted. Do not use cat, dog, or pig manure in gardens or compost manure. Cats, dogs, and pigs are capable of carrying pathogens that are transferable to humans. One of the challenges with container gardening is how to overwinter a container plant. Containers lack the buffering capacity of the earth and thus special attention needs to be how to slowly cool the plant down so that it goes into proper dormancy before it completely freezes. Some of your options are is to move the plant into an unheated building for the winter, to actually lift a liner out of the container and sink it into the ground, or possibly lining around the plant bales of straw to act as insulation so that the plant slowly cools down before freezing so that you have a better chance of overwintering the containered plant. Mother Nature is responsible for a lot of the injuries that we see on our garden plants and I have pictured here just a few of them. Uh, the main one that you're going to see here are the different aspects of freeze injury all the way from uh, scarring on a fruit as you see as uh, represented as a frost ring on plum uh, to freeze injury on a grape. Grapes are interesting in that they have a secondary and tertiary growth that if their primary bud is killed there's a possibility that the secondary and tertiary is still still alive so you might still get a crop even after you've had um, a pretty significant freeze. Most other crops don't have that option. If we have a significant freeze while an apple or peach is in bloom, that's it for the year, no crop. But with grape, we can actually get a uh, possibility of a crop if the freeze is not too severe. Um, looking at strawberry flowers on the lower center, you can see two flowers. One has a brown center and one has a nice uh, sunshiny yellow center. The one with the brown center has been actually injured by frost. So this is a way for you to walk through your strawberries and identify whether your flowers have been damaged or not. If you look in the upper right hand side you can see what the fruit looks like after a flower has been uh, injured by said frost. Got a picture of a peach that's been severely impacted by hail. Uh, you need to really be on top of your disease control because these wounds until they heal are very open to uh, disease and insect attack. I also have a picture of a flooded sweet corn field in the upper center. Uh, note to all of you, um, if you have flooded uh, food crop plants, any, any edible portion that's come in contact with flood waters is not con safe, considered safe to consume. Um, if uh, we really don't know what's in these uh, waters, what type of contaminants, and some of these contaminants can actually be absorbed by the plant, so wash off is not always good enough. So just keep in mind any component, edible component that's made contact with flood water is not considered safe to eat. Mother Nature has some other, um, particularly including wind, and I've got another ice picture here, but you can kind of see the effects of wind, a uh, young tree that's been wallowed around, and you can see that uh, if this is not filled back in, this can actually act somewhat as a pool that will actually drown the young tree if it's not addressed. Uh, we also have uh, drought and heat stress problems. Whenever we see uh, twinning um, or double fruit on a peach tree, that's usually indicative that there was a drought the previous fall when the uh, next season's crop was uh, just starting to initialize. So um, next year's crop um, usually is set uh, the previous year and if we should happen to have a drought, it usually results in this type of twinning in peach trees. 
interesting picture on the lower uh, right hand corner. This is a peach orchard that I visited that had been uh, had a heavy ice load and actually split these trees usually three to four ways and laid them flat on the ground. Uh, the orchardist or the owner sent his crew out and, and pushed them back together and lag bolted them and uh, the trees uh, are healing nicely and actually set a crop that same year and have continued to thrive and, and set crops. So if you act quickly sometimes a tree can be saved and as you see in the lower center um, that tree has completely been broken off. There, there is nothing that can be done for that one. That one's uh, been snapped off in the wind. These are all pictures of the effect of sunburn. Uh, you can see the blackening on the grapes, um, the actual cooking of the fruit of the pepper, um, same cooking on the tomato and the blackberry. Again, these are all um, sunburn in terms of uh, overheating and too much direct sunlight. Uh, remember, plants can't walk away from the sun like many of us can. Uh, and sometimes they just don't have enough leaf protection and they actually burn on the plant. So if you see something like this, there's no toxicity involved. They just lose their palatability because of this uh, cooked um, material. Sometimes it's, it's softened and, and a secondary fungus can come in and turn it black. And sometimes it's hardened and not palatable. Uh, in the lower left hand, you can see an apple that has uh, an actual sunburn uh, on it and that area will not have as good of post-harvest uh, shelf life as a fruit that uh, does not have sunburn. Nutritional problems can often look like disease. In this case we have a calcium deficiency on pepper, tomato, and apple. Um, calcium deficiency on pepper and tomato is called blossom end rot and on apple it's called cork. I also have a picture of iron deficiency that was actually induced because of the pH being too high. So on the uh, blueberry we can actually um, address the iron deficiency but if we don't address the pH problem the iron deficiency will just continually be a problem. So keep in mind it's not always disease. Sometimes it, it is a nutritional disorder that needs to be addressed. Hopefully this series of images will aid you in identifying any current or future problems in your garden. This has been Elizabeth Wally, University of Illinois Extension.